morning, Bethel Baptist Church. Hope everybody is doing well this morning. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, I want to invite you to turn back with me to that little book toward the end of the Old Testament named Habakkuk. A number of you have mentioned, man, I, I, I've known this book was in the Bible, but I've never spent time in this book so much, and, and have mentioned how much just walking through this book has meant to you. And so, and I, I want to say uh, that one of the great things about preaching through books of the Bible is that God honors this. This is one of the reasons why we do this, is because there are things that are contained in God's Word that very often, until we start digging into it, we don't realize we need, and then when we are in it, we go, oh yeah, I was needing that like two, three years ago. I'm needing this right now. So this is one of the reasons why we love here. The main diet of our preaching is preaching through books of the Bible. If you have that, I want to encourage you to stand with me. We're going to start not a longer passage today. We're going to start in verse 6 of chapter 2, read all the way down through verse 20. You read along silently. I'm going to read along aloud. If you do not have a Bible, you can read along off the screen with us this morning. Will not all these take up a taunt song against him, even mockery and insinuations against him, and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his, for how long? And he has made himself rich with loans. Will not your creditors rise up suddenly, and those who collect from you awaken? Indeed, you will become plunder for them, because you have looted many nations. All the remainder of the people will loot you, because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town, and all its inhabitants. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to put his nest on high, to be delivered from the hand of calamity. You have devised a shameful thing for your house by cutting off many peoples. So you are sinning against yourself. Surely the stone will cry out from the wall and the rafter will answer it from the framework. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with violence. Is it not indeed from the Lord of hosts that people toil for fire, and nations grow weary for nothing, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who makes your neighbor drink, who mixes in your venom even to make them drunk, so as to look on their nakedness. You will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. Now you yourself drink, expose your own nakedness. The cup of the Lord's right hand will come around to you, and utter disgrace will come upon your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you. And the devastation of its beasts by which you terrified them because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town, and all its inhabitants. What profit is the idol when its maker has carved it? Or an image, a teacher of falsehood, for its maker trusts in his own handiwork when he fashions speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a piece of wood, Awake! To a mute stone, arise, and that is your teacher? Behold, it's overlaid with gold and silver. There is no breath at all inside it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity to come into your house, to praise you together corporately, to hear your word proclaimed. Lord, we ask that you would change our hearts today. Lord, we ask that you would uh, reset 
our focus, reset our eyes that we would see you and see what you are doing even in our world today, even as you were in Habakkuk's time. And may you be honored and glorified. May your people know what you have purchased for them and glory in you. And may, Lord, those who do not yet know you, may they hear clearly what you have done for them. And it's in your name that we ask for this, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You ever have one of those moments when you realized life was not about you? Aren't those glorious and awful at the same time? We need to learn those lessons. And for many of us, uh, this happens when we become parents. I remember my mom telling me once, you know, I think it was soon after Madeline was born, you know, God doesn't give you children to make you happy. He gives you children to make you more (laughs) Christ-like. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, that is, hey, wait a minute, that's about me. (laughs) Yes. We learn quickly especially when we have children, yeah, this isn't really about me. And in fact, one of the marks of maturity is recognizing, you know what? It really isn't all about me. This isn't about what I can get. This is about what I can give. Recognizing that the story of our lives and the story of your life, in that story, You're not even the main character. I'm not the main character in my life. The Lord is. And this passage today helps us see that. This passage helps us redirect our focus because there's a a couple of ways that we can read this passage. Number one, there's the way that we can read, oh, this is stuff that's just going to happen to, to bad people, and you know what? They deserve it. But the other way is to recognize that even as Habakkuk, from the very first verses of this book, has been crying out, God, where are you? God, are you active? God, do you even hear? Do you even care? And maybe you've been there recently. Maybe you're there today. What we hear from this passage is that, yes, he does hear. Yes, he does see. God, don't you see what's going on? Yes, he does. And he is responding And he is responding in his time, in his way. And he is right in what he does. He is correct in all of his judgments. He is actively God, not passive. And we see that in this passage today. As we look at our lives, as we look at Scripture... One pastor said, there are two ways they can read it. You can read it as all about you or all about Christ. And today what I want to do is I want us to help see that this passage is all about the Lord. It's all about here's what Christ will do for all of his believers. How he rescues us from certain judgment that is coming for every single person. We may ask, God, do you see what's going on? Do you know what's happening? Do you care what's going on? Yes, he certainly does see. Yes, he certainly does care. And he recognizes this at a level much deeper than even you or I even dare to think. Let's take a look at this passage today. Let's take a look at how this passage shows us who the Lord is today. We begin this section actually picking up right where we left off last week. So if you recall, last week, God is responding to Habakkuk. And God is saying, look, I'm answering. I'm not going to be silent. Record this. Write it down. In fact, don't just write it down. Put it in stone. It's happening. This is going to go down. And then proceeds to tell him, That while the proud person, and this is the Babylonians, the one that Habakkuk's like, how could you use those who are more evil than your people to judge your people? 
The proud one, his soul isn't right in him. As for my righteous one, he will live by his faith, setting up for us, as we drew out last week, that there is a big difference. There are basically two types of people, those who are sinners and proud and run to that, and those who are sinners and repent and trust in the Lord. The just, the righteous ones live by faith. And then he responds to Habakkuk's questions about what are you going to do with Babylon? Is this going to go on forever and ever? Is this the way you work? That you, I mean, you set up justice, but you yourself don't follow that justice? God says, oh, no, no, no. I'm acting. And here are the ways I am acting. And in fact, he says that this, that those who have been mistreated, those who Babylon has come up against, they will take up a taunt song against them. You ever played a game against an opponent you didn't really like? And you ended up beating them pretty handily? And the crowd starts singing something about, hey, 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 goodbye, something like that. Yeah, and you know what's going on. You're like, yeah, that's right. Start the bus. Yeah, where are those keys? Bye-bye. Bye-bye. There's a taunt song going on there. But this is exactly what God says. The people that Babylon has mistreated, specifically the people of Israel, will do one day. Babylonians are coming, and they are going to do all of these awful things. There will come a day when they will stand and glory over them. And then he proceeds, God does, to give five woes. Now, We're from Oklahoma, so when we hear the word woe, we usually think one of two things. We think horses, or we think of self-pity. Oh, woe is me. Okay, whatever. Yeah, it sounds archaic. It sounds foolish. But what this word is actually used in the Old Testament in two specific places. It's used when people are taken to court and listed off, here are the things you have done. It's a legal listing of all of the crimes they have committed. And it's also used at funerals. And the context of this word woe, the the feeling of that word, gives the idea of judgment and death. It's not a pretty, happy, weird, archaic word. No, 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 no. This is a harsh word. This is a word that should grate on us. This is a word that is mean. Woe, he begins the first one. Woe to him who increases what is not his, who makes himself rich with loans. Okay, so what's going on here? He's speaking all of these against Babylon, and so we need to remember that. And so it's a little bit poetic what's going on here, so we have to use our minds as we grasp these pictures. So we can see how Babylon would go in and take all sorts of things and grow their country by mistreating and taking over other countries. That's what he's speaking about. He's pronouncing this judgment upon them because they are going in and making themselves rich by stealing from other people. That's not too hard to grasp, is it? That sounds actually quite familiar. We might not think of other nations a lot doing that today, although that does happen. We do think of other people who do that. We do think of other businesses that do this. But then he uses this weird word. Why does he use the word loans? He makes himself rich with loans. They're not going in loaning. They're going in and stealing. Well, the idea of a loan is that you use it for a while, and then you have to pay it back, right? It's going back to the original person that owned it. And that's why he uses this. You're going to go in, Babylon, you're going to take over all these things, but guess what? You're not going to keep them. You're going to take these riches, you're not going to keep them. You're going to use them, but you are not going to keep them. God, in his judgment, will stand up for his people and come against those who have mistreated him. 
mistreated them, excuse me, verse 7, will not these creditors, these people they've stolen from, suddenly rise up and those who collect from you awaken? Again, the idea is them being stirred and awakened to battle, to action. These are, again, frightening words. This is what God will do. He will take those who have been defeated and use them to come against those who have defeated them. This is what God is going to do with his people in this situation. Indeed, you will become plunder for them because you've looted many nations. The plunderers will become the plundered. God's might and justice are seen here as those who have come in and stolen will have not only things stolen back from them, but they themselves will be destroyed. And this is the picture that we see even today. Babylon is, well, it's a ruin, and that's it. No one has been there since that nation was overthrown. The city of Babylon was thought to be just impregnable. You couldn't take it over. It was destroyed by the Persians. And those who had been captured by the Babylonians were then set free. In fact, I think this is really, really interesting. When we take a look in the Old Testament, you talk about this idea, all those things that they've stolen, they're going to take back. So you read in the book of Haggai, and you read uh, in uh, other books in the Old Testament, Isaiah, where, where, where God's people are sent back. And they're sent back from this captivity. Zerubbabel is leading them. And one of the things that they are sent back with All of the things from the temple that were stolen, all of the things the Babylonians came in and took from the temple, guess what? They got to take them back. Will not your creditors suddenly rise up and those who collect from you awaken? Indeed, you will become plunder for them. What's going on here? What's the problem here? Theft, stealing. This is something that we are all familiar with, and we all recognize, yeah, that's not something that we should be doing, but this is something that God judges, and this is something that does not escape God's eyes. Sometimes we look at situations, and we take a look at what's happening in our world, and we, like Habakkuk, go, God, don't you see what these people are doing? Don't you see what this nation is doing against that nation? Don't you see how ISIS is acting here? Don't you see how these people that I am working for are treating me or treating other people like this? Yes, he does see. Yes, he does. This does not escape his view. Perhaps you have been in a situation where you have been mistreated in this way. God has not forgotten you. God sees you and knows you. God understands. The second one, verse 9. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house. What's going on here? I mean, to put his nest on high. Again, very picturesque language. Here's the idea. Just as an eagle places its nest really, really high where nobody else can get to it, Babylonians were coming in and they're like, hey, we want to make sure we're safe and here's the easiest way we can make sure we're safe. We will wipe out everybody else around us so they are no longer a threat. We'll just wipe them out. We'll just kill them all. That'll work. And those that we don't kill, we'll make them our slaves. So that we can be safe. So that we can be secure. So that we will be okay. We will not fall into harm. Security is something that we all want. And this is what they were going after. There's nothing wrong with security. Security is a good thing. We want security. We want security emotionally. We want security in terms of our family. We want security in terms of uh, money and monetarily. We want security physically so that we are not endangered. But that security comes from the Lord. And if you recall, where did these people find their strength? They found their strength not in the Lord, which is where God's people were called to find their strength. They found their strength in their own ability. In their own strength. This is what they gloried in. This is what they desired. And consequently, what happens when you do that? You end up mistreating other people. Believer, your security is found in Christ. This is where your hope is. 
When your hope is in other things, you end up mistreating other people, just like the Babylonians did here. When your hope is in your strength and how good you are and what you can do and what you can produce and whether it's on the job or at home, your strength will end up, if you find your hope and security there, that will end up harming others. And this is something that God himself sees. Notice what he says about this in verse 10. You have devised a shameful thing for your house. He was doing this to provide security for his house. In this society, shame and honor are the two paradigms. Not guilt and innocence as in our culture, but shame and honor. And so they have brought shame on their house because of this. And they are sinning against themselves. This has had the exact opposite effect of what they wanted. And when we seek for security in our own ability, in our own strength alone, not trusting the Lord, sure, trust the Lord and do what he has said. But when we find that simply in ourselves, simply in what we can produce, things will backfire. They will produce the opposite effect of what we wanted. This summer, I had the opportunity to uh, uh, read a couple of things, a couple of books on Chernobyl. If you're not familiar with Chernobyl, 1986, April, or April of 1986, uh, the big nuclear power plant uh, there in uh, the Ukraine, part of the former Soviet Union. And uh, yeah, one of the nuclear reactors exploded, and it's really awful. It's actually made that entire area uninhabitable. Weird thing today, it's actually a cool thing. People can go in and like tour that area now. I think that's crazy. That's absolutely ludicrous. That stuff will kill you, okay? Don't do that. But here's one of the things that's absolutely fascinating about this. That happened, the accident, the explosion, during and as a result of a safety test. Yes, a safety, okay, safety, you're doing a safety test and something explodes. That's horrible. That's awful. This is not the result you are looking for. But this is exactly the situation that Habakkuk talks about here. They were expecting safety and security for themselves by doing this. But in doing this, in the way they had done this, the way they sought to do this by taking advantage of others, destroying others, plundering others, at the expense of others, all they did was destroy their own house. In verse 11, even the house they sought to build will testify against him. The stone will cry out from the wall. The rafter will answer it from the framework stones. This is exactly what all of the houses are built out of there. There's like nothing built that isn't built out of stone. Every house is built out of stone there. All the walls, everything is stone except for the roof. And this is where they put beams across. And then they put like thatch and then they put down mud and then more thatch and more mud and more thatch and more mud. This is why in the New Testament they said that uh, they brought a paralytic to Jesus and they couldn't get in the house because there were so many people. So what did they do? They dug through the roof. Well, that doesn't make any sense to us. Well, it makes perfect sense there because that's what their roofs were made out of. That's how they, how they did things here. They were able to move some of the thatch and the mud and they moved these things out. This is what buildings were made out of. This is the house they were trying to build, and the walls and the roof will testify against them. The very thing they were trying to provide security for will not only be destroyed, but it will testify against them. I want you to notice not only that they plundered men and they also purposefully destroyed, I want you to notice as well, premeditated murder. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed, and found a town with violence. Babylonians were not known as nice people. They came through and wiped people out. And in fact, what they were known for is coming through, and they would uh, basically send an emissary to your king and said, hey, would you like to give to the Babylonian tribute fund? And if you said no, they said, okay, that's fine, that's fine. We'll just come through with our army and kill all of you. And those that do survive will take you as captives. And then people immediately perked up and said, oh, yeah, we'll be happy to give now. And so this is the way they founded their nation, bloodshed, 
killing people, destruction, go through, wipe people out. This did not go unnoticed by God. But this is often what we think. God, where are you? Just like Habakkuk. God, why aren't you doing anything now? Where have you been? This has been going on for a while. What's going on? Why aren't you doing anything? And what we see over and over from this passage is this. God is not lazy. God is not lax. God has not been away on vacation. God is not asleep and needs to be wakened. God has not been, you know, forgetful. God isn't just looking somewhere else and this happens in a way in a corner where he doesn't see it. God is actively watching and acting. Take a look at verse 13. Even though Babylon used bloodshed and violence as their tools and materials to build their own empire. Notice what the Lord is doing. Is it not from the Lord of hosts? This means he's the God of armies, the sovereign God who rules over the nations completely by his own ability. That people toil for fire. That people spend all of their life working and working and working and working only to watch it all just burn up. To go away. To not last. And nations grow weary for nothing. God frustrates our attempts to find ultimate fulfillment in anything but Him. He is actively working, even now, even in your life, to frustrate your attempts to find ultimate meaning and fulfillment in anything outside of Him. You think, well, that's kind of self-centered of God. Why would He do that? Well, first of all, because He's God. Secondly, because He knows how He wired us. And thirdly, because that isn't there. It doesn't exist. There is no fulfillment or happiness or joy or meaning for us apart from the Lord. Everything goes away. Everything else will fail. Everything else will fade. Ecclesiastes has this same issue. In fact, Ecclesiastes says it a different way. He says, people work and work and work and work and provide all of these things for themselves, but I find that they don't enjoy them. Have you ever felt like that? I have all this stuff and I don't enjoy any of it. Because the Lord cannot and will not give us fulfillment, meaning, purpose apart from himself. He will frustrate every single endeavor that way. In fact, he goes a little bit further, Ecclesiastes, Solomon does in Ecclesiastes, and says, you know, you're going to work all your life, and you're going to like, build up all this stuff, and you're going to have money and houses and different things like that, and then you're going to die, and you're going to leave it to your son, and he's probably not going to be as smart as you are. He's probably going to lose it all, because that's what happened to Solomon. It's exactly what happened to Solomon. It all goes away. So much of what we seek after and glory in will not last even this year. God will frustrate every attempt on your behalf, on their behalf, to find meaning and fulfillment apart from Him. And then one of the most important verses in the Old Testament. Perhaps you've never heard this verse. Verse 14. What is God doing? He's pushing us toward a purpose. He's pushing us a specific direction. And there will come a day when this will happen. But that's not always a good thing for everyone. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. In Isaiah 11, 9, says something very similar. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We will recognize and know 
who Jesus Christ is. Recognize Him as Lord. Recognize the Father and the Son. See them for who they really are. There will come a day when that will happen. And in fact, Isaiah and then Philippians, quoting Isaiah, says that's going to happen. We sang about that just a little bit earlier. One day, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But that's not always a good thing for some people. Unless you know him. If you know him, that will be a glorious day. That will be amazing. But for those who do not, that is a day of judgment. That is a cry of lament. He is Lord, you will say so one day, and you will say so either willingly rejoicing in your Lord and Savior, or you will say so resigned to your fate in a living hell apart from him, headed to a living hell apart from him. One day, this will happen. Which reminds us that the judgments that are talked about here are not simply about what's going to happen in Habakkuk's time, or shortly thereafter, or within 70 years of that time. No, what we see here is that God recognizes sin and sees it much more clearly than you or I do. And He is going to rightly and justly judge it. He is God. We want a just and righteous God. We said this several weeks ago. When that person like zips down in front of you, that merge now lane. Yeah. And you're like, okay, I'll move over now. We're all getting in line and we're all waiting and slowly going along. And then you have that one person who figures they're more important than anybody else that zips by everybody like half mile ago the merge now sign was. But they're zipping in front of everybody else. There are some unredeemed thoughts that go through my mind at those moments. <laughs> and at those times, we want a God of justice. No mercy. Justice. If I need to swap some paint for that justice, I'm willing to do that. We see somebody, our light turns green, and we're getting ready to go, and then somebody comes right across the intersection. We want justice. Not just for us, but man, if they're doing that here, they could be doing that to other people. God is a God of justice. God will act, and he acts for the glory of his name. There will come a day when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, and people will know him. But that day, that day will be different If you do not trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that day will not be a day of hope. Notice notice the fourth point real quickly. They prayed on their neighbors, and we've got to hit this really, really quickly. Woe to you who mix or mix your neighbors drink, who mix venom to make them drunk so that you can look on their nakedness. Uh, One of the things that they did as punishment in those days, they would parade the people that they had captured in in front of their people. And so, and uh, one of the commentaries I was reading said that this might be one of the ways that they punished them, that they would make them walk in with no dignity at all. So, yeah, nothing. And they are laughed at and mocked. This is the way they mistreated their neighbors. They took them over. This is what Babylon was doing. We know much about the mistreatment of other people. We know a lot in our society today about people getting taken advantage of. In fact, we as Southern Baptists have become very, very familiar that that's been happening within our churches recently. Actually, it's been happening for a while. We're just becoming aware of it. That Babylon preyed on people, saw them as food for themselves to mistreat and treat however they wanted to. 
And sometimes people today, even within churches, do this. God sees this. Perhaps you have been a victim of something like this. And we want you to find a welcoming and understanding place here. We want a place that will be safe for whoever walks through our doors in that respect. We do not want to be a place that is preying upon other people. This is something God notices and will judge. And then finally, they were praying to idols. And you find really quite a hysterical statement back and forth here. They're praying to pieces of wood. My kids love to watch this video of this uh, um, guy ventriloquist, and he's got this little wooden dummy that he's talking through. And so I always find that fascinating because it really does, the people that are doing this and can do it well, um, it really does look like that dummy is talking. And so then you realize that you're the dummy because you actually think the piece of wood is talking. So one of the... One of the things they did is he called on somebody, and he was, you know, the dummy was talking with this guy, and it was really, really kind of funny. He's like, hey, you know what? What? You're talking to a piece of wood. I mean, this is the dummy telling him this. It's exactly what he's doing. He's, he's talking with a piece of wood. And we think, oh, that's ridiculous. Th- those, those don't talk back. It's exactly God's point here. Our idols, their idols, Greta, we might not have pieces of wood that are carved, overlaid with silver and gold. But they can't hear us. When we call on them, awake, arise, help us, we need help, they can't help. When we go to the doctor and the doctor says, there's nothing we can do, those idols can't do a thing about it. Nobody's listening when we call on them. And it doesn't matter If your idol is something that is covered with gold or if your idol is a team that you happen to follow. It doesn't matter if your idol is something that is a stone that you have or a carved piece of stone in your house. Or if your idol is how much money you have in your bank account. Your idol cannot deliver you. It cannot save. It cannot hear you. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why at the end of 1 John, John calls to the people who are believers and in the very last verse says, keep yourselves from idols. Why? Because all they do is steal our hearts away from the Lord. This is all they do. This is exactly what it did for the Babylonians. They aren't real. They can't hear. And God will judge us for our idolatry because through these things we have walked in ways not only against him, but also against others. Notice verse 20, though. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. This is a mild rebuke, I think, against Habakkuk here. God, why aren't you acting? And and quite honestly, a mild rebuke against us. Very often, our prayers assume that God isn't doing anything. That we need to call on him like people call on their idols. God, you need to wake up. Come on, wake up here. When you're boss at work and you're walking around, you're the one that's trying to have to tell people, going to have to tell people, hey, let's, let's do our jobs. Come on, let's get to work. Let's do what we're supposed to do here. It is not the workers who should be going around telling the boss, hey, Wake up, don't fall asleep on the job. We need to do our job. We need you to do your job. That's not the way that should work, right? That, that's a great way to get fired, quite honestly. But uh, yeah, so it is utterly ridiculous for us to forget that God is ruling and reigning even now. Even though we don't see it. Even though we don't like it, what we see around us. Even though we may not understand how he could be ruling and reigning with all of the things going on, he is. And this is precisely what he is calling Habakkuk to see. And you see in the next chapter, Habakkuk gets this message. You might not be having a country that is coming in and threatening to attack us here in the United States. We might be facing a 
very different problem. You might be facing a very different problem in your life. But the same principles are true here as they are in your life. God is active. God is working. God is here. God is accomplishing his word. God is doing precisely what he said he was going to do. He's not asleep. He's not forgotten you. He is actively reigning now. Let all the earth be silent before him. This doesn't mean that we never sing. Our place is we are called to enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. At the exact same time, there are commands to be still or cease striving and know that he is God. There is an honor and a reverence that should go on in our worship, recognizing whose presence we are heading into, recognizing him and not playing around with that. Perhaps you might today think, ah, I'm not really sure I believe any of this. Well, I want to encourage you today. The Bible in this passage tells us that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. This day is coming. And the problem is most of the things that you will put your hope in to deliver you on that day simply won't be able to deliver. Whether that's money or your good actions or good intentions, they won't work. And you are in a place because you are a sinner. I want to say this very clearly. So am I. So is every other person in this room and everyone outside of here. Well, we are guilty before God and we are on our own and in what, what, what we can bring to the table, hopeless. You've got no hope on that day. This is what makes Christ such good news. Because let's just be honest. What did we have here in this situation? Let's be honest with ourselves here. We had theft. We're probably all guilty of that. We've had making people, making themselves great by putting down other people and hurting other people. Yeah, we, we've done that too. Maybe not to the degree that Babylonians have, but we've done those things. Seeking to find hope and security for ourselves in some other place other than the Lord. Yeah, we've done that. Mistreatment, taking advantage of people. Yeah, yeah, we've done that. God's eyes not only see the Babylonian sin, they see our sin. And we are guilty. And Christ came for the guilty. Not for the good, the guilty. Bearing the weight of your sin on his shoulders to the cross. All of the punishment due to you for your sin fell upon Christ. Why? The scripture tells us that because God chose to love you. In Christ and in Christ alone you can be forgiven. Will you trust in Christ? Because there is no hope for escaping the judgment apart from Christ. Will you trust him today? Believer, this passage reminds us that God is active and working even now. Even tomorrow morning when you get up and go to work. Even when you get that phone call that's something awful and terrible. And the encouragement of this passage is to trust him regardless of what is going on around us. Regardless of the situation, regardless of what we see in front of us. Regardless if everybody else tells us, no, God's not doing anything and there's no hope here. We can trust in the Lord. Will you trust Him today? Bethel Baptist Church. We as a church need to be a place, and I want to read this because I think it's just beautiful. That live lives markedly different than what the Babylonians did. This pastor said this, for our churches, this passage should encourage us 
to be marked by characteristics opposite those mark that marked the Babylonians. They were marked by theft. Our churches should be marked by generosity and grace. They were marked by selfishness and injustice. Our churches should be marked by honesty and straight dealing and concern for righteousness. They were marked by violence and crime. Our churches should be marked by mutual care for one another. They were marked by debauchery and exploitation, using others for their own pleasure. Our churches should be marked by mutual encouragement and building up one another. They were marked by idolatry. Our churches should be marked by worship of the one true God as taught by His Word. This is who we should be, Bethel Baptist. Displaying the very opposite of what we see Babylon doing in this passage. Displaying the very character of Christ. More and more and more. Let's pray. Let's respond to Jesus today. Heavenly Father, we